The Ten Commandments, you've heard me say many times, split them in half, and you've got half of the instructions are the man-God relationship, and half of the instructions are the man-man relationship instructions. You've heard me say that before, correct? Okay. So I want you to think of the burnt offering a little bit like the God-man relationship. And we are going to look at, I'm going to introduce the, turn the page if you have a Bible like mine, second chapter of Leviticus is what your header should read as meat offerings. And so if you look at the burnt offering and the meat offering, they are immediately, there are two real clear distinctions between these offerings. The burnt offering is the life offered up and for the most part, wholly consumed on the altar. The meat offering, which I don't want to call it that, so we're going to change the name of it for clarity. But the meat offering is, there is no life offered up. In fact, when you're reading the instructions, it sounds like somebody's going to be breaking, baking some pretty tasty bread or a cake. That's how good it sounds. So there's no life being laid down. There's no blood in it. So there, right, right at the get-go, you've got two really clear distinctions. But remember, I just mentioned the law, and I have to make this connection within the burnt offering. And for this, I'm going to keep calling it meat until I tell you what I'm going to call it, in that the burnt offering, a life completely offered up to God, the God-man relationship, the meat offering resembles more, we'll call it, the man-to-man -man or brotherly love component of the law. And you might say, why? And I'll explain to you. But between the meat and the peace offerings, we have more of a fellowship communion presentation than anything else. So as I'm going through this message, I'm going to return back to try and explain how these connect to the two parts of the law and hopefully you'll see it. That's why I said it's challenging because these are theological concepts that if a person doesn't have those, you might struggle to say, well, how are, they, how are you connecting them to that? And how are they represented by these patterns? So hopefully as I get into the message, it'll become more clear. So bear with me on that. All right. So your King James has called this, and many other translations have called this a meat offering. I hate that they did that, although... At the time that this book was being translated, they used that because meat may not have necessarily represented carne meat, all right? Like could have represented meat in, in a, another description, more generically food. But for us, meat is meat. So I'd prefer for you and I to call this the meal offering. And when you think meal, you think cornmeal, flour meal, think of grain. So you're not thinking meat. There is no meat, no beef, okay? Nada. Okay. I hope that's clear, as I think it should be. All right. Let me read a little bit here, because this one has the instructions in Chapter 2 and then more details later on. And the complexity of this, kind of interesting. Whereas, for example, in the burnt offering, if you remember, we had several class categories. So you could offer up from the herd, from the flock, or the very poor person could offer up turtle doves. Here, God makes the same provisions, but it's in the method of the presentation. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, whether it is baked or the term being used in the King James fry pan, but there would be three cooking classes, if you will. you all start at 9 o'clock. <laughs> Just checking to make sure you're not asleep, all right? Because, oh, well, it's Leviticus. Uh, it's kind of boring. It's not boring, okay? It's not. All right. So uh, let us read the second chapter. And this is under the heading now, Newly Not Meet. In fact, if you have a Bible like mine, if, if you have bad eyes like mine and you look from afar, it might look like meal. <laughs> Missed the little line through the T. All right. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. 
and you shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, and the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. So here we have a common thread. The burnt offering and the meal offering are both going to be referred to as sweet savor. But remember, this is a bloodless offering. The remnant of the, I'm going to try and say it everywhere it, it occurs, the remnant of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his sons, it is a thing most holy of the offerings of, of the Lord made by fire. So here's another thing. A lot of times you're going to read instructions given where people are told to eat the thing that, or the portion that they would receive in the holy place. And I want you to think about that, because that actually seems a little bit weird. And forgive me for this, because how I'm going to say this should jar you a little bit. It, it, to me, would be taking food into the holy place would be like, the, this is the opposite illustration, would be like taking some food into your bathroom. It's just somehow that you're going to eat, just somehow doesn't seem right, right? Because it's holy, it, you would think you wouldn't be eating it, be like something you shouldn't be doing in the holy place. But there is a reason why every time you read about where the instructions are to consume it in the holy place, I want you to think about the fact that if this offering was the portion was given to the priest or the partaker, the offerer, to consume on his or her own, they might actually take it and go along the way and consume it in a way that is not discerning the spiritual nature of what was done. So consuming it in the holy place isn't being disrespectful. It's like saying, pay attention to what you're doing in the moment you're doing it. Don't be distracted. And Lord knows that we spend a lot of our time being distracted. So there's a reason. In fact, I love the fact that there are so many things included in here and there's purpose. It's not just because God just wanted to have word salad put out there. There are purpose, express purposes for all of these. All right, so uh, if thou bring an oblation, of a meal offering. Here's the first one, bacon in the oven. So baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And if thy oblation be a meal offering, bacon in a pan. So we went from in an oven to a pan or a griddle. It shall be a fine flour unleavened mingled with oil. Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil thereon, it is a meal offering. If thy oblation be a meal offering, bacon in the frying pan. So we have three different techniques, if you will, but they are not techniques as in personal preference. Believe it or not, if a person could bake a cake in an oven, it means they were a person of means and a person who had to use what is being called a fry pan. Don't think of it as fry pan in our day and age would be someone who was rather poor. Think of just a, just a surface to, to on a fire, not anything that was designed as such. So these three kind of show you a little bit of, again, God makes provisions for the rich, the middle class, and the poor. Thou shalt bring the meal offering that is made of these things unto the Lord when it is presented unto the priest. He shall bring it unto the altar, and the priest shall take from the meal offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. We have it there again. In fact, if you were to look up the two words that keep reappearing through Leviticus over and over again, one of those words is atonement 45 times, holiness or holy is, I think, almost 90 times. And you, if you keep reading, you're going to find sacrifice, all these words that are repeated. Probably in Leviticus, we've got the smallest amount of vocabulary, because the words, there's so much repetition of key words. It's very interesting if a person is interested in spending their time looking up words. I don't know who that would be, by the way. You know anybody that would do that? I don't know. Okay, so, and that which is left of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. No meal offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. 
It's very, very important. This is one part of the instructions. You shall burn no leaven nor any honey in the offering of the Lord made by fire. The oblation of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord. They shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. I'll go on in a minute because there's different components to this, but let's talk about a little bit here of what's being said. First and foremost, remember what I said about the burnt offering last week. There is no mention of sin or the sinner per se. Yes, the sinner may be bringing, but that is not the intent of the burnt offering. That is not the reason why a person would bring it. The same thing is true here when you're reading about the meal offering. There is no mention, and he shall bring it for an, to make an atonement for his sin. There is no mention of that. What you're not going to read about in the second chapter regarding the meal offering, you're not going to read about the sinful nature of man or what sin was or what trespass was committed. It's not there. And this is important to understand. Remember, the burnt offering was voluntary. The meal offering if you read very carefully, and when any will offer a meal offering unto the Lord, there is no prescription immediately. That becomes clear why one might bring a meal offering. You've got to go to the sixth chapter onward to make sense of that, okay? But when we begin to investigate, we can kind of see these and possibly including the peace offering, but we haven't even touched that yet. These two offerings as in a class of their own. It might be well, as I said, to say, for example, if the burnt offering was a life offered up, the meal offering is the fruits of that life. So what do I mean by that? Where does one get flour from? Flour has to be cultivated from something. It could be corn, it could be wheat, and then it has to be worked. It has to be processed in order to bring it as an offering. So it would be the fruit of somebody's labor. So if you kind of look at these two offerings in that perspective, you can kind of see where you could start separating them into those two separate tables. If it's not clear as we keep going, it might get more clear. If we take the offering that we've seen thus far, and let me finish reading because there's a little bit more instructions I want to talk about a few things I mentioned no leaven and no honey. Let's talk about that for a minute. So leaven is always associated in the scripture, always with evil, wrongdoing. You know, Jesus warns, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the leaven of Herod, the evil, the pernicious ways. So no leaven, and ye shall burn no leaven nor honey, and I think I read somewhere in here about that there will be frankincense as well added on here. Frankincense is in verse 15. So the reason for no honey and not even putting honey to the fire is if you heat honey, honey will ferment and kind of go to the sour side. It will lose its sweetness. The frankincense, on the other hand, does the reverse. By heating it, it brings out all of the smell or the odor or the perfume of it, it actually intensifies it. So no leaven. This offering, if you want to put it in a way that Paul would say leaven versus sincerity or honesty, something done in goodness. So although that is not the intent of the offering, but if you step away in the big picture, whatever is being brought, no leaven, no evil or hypocrisy brought into the equation, no honey, and the frankincense, of course, bringing the fragrant odor. And then, as I said, three different uh, ways to give from the oven all the way down to the fry pan. And then let me read on here. Every oblation of thy meal offering shall thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meal offering, with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Salt, preservative. And think about it this way. So no leaven, what could corrupt, what could become evil, salt, which was always purifying, preserving. So you've got these 
kind of we'll call them opposites of things, do and don't do for obvious reasons, but something in there, the salt of the covenant of thy God. So it's interesting that, and you'll read this in many different places about salt. Uh, we're told, for example, of our speech to speak with grace seasoned with salt. That is not an accident. It's not like God said, yes, I want the flavor of the cakes you're baking to be salty. That's not the intent. So there was that kind of covenant sealing with the salt involved. And there's a lot more to this, but for the sake of not going too far regarding a comma, uh, I'm trying to keep this moving here. All right, thou shalt put oil upon it, verse 15, lay frankincense thereon, it is a meal offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, part of the oil thereof, with all frankincense thereof, it is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, two things, again, between the burnt offering and the meal offering. So if you remember in the burnt offering, when it came to the innards, it said, wash with water. Here we have an application of oil. Again, remember, we're looking at shadows and types as well. So I find it interesting that in the burnt offering, the water symbolizing the washing, if you will, we are washed with the word of God, versus the oil, which is more like the anointing of God's spirit. Now, that's not to say that those are the activities going on in this Old Testament act. But if you, again, step away and look at the bigger picture, there is actually a whole picture of our salvation, of our faith walk, that's painted in these offerings. And that's why I said God starts with the burnt offering. He starts with what's important to him, burnt offering, burnt meal, peace, sin, trespass. We come to God, the first thing we're concerned about, once our eyes are opened, and we stop saying, I'm basically a good person. Once our eyes are open, we realize we're sinners. We sin. We sin because we are in this Adamic nature, and we also sin by virtue of the fruit we bear being in this container. So once that reality comes, our whole approach to God is, I'm a sinner, I know I've sinned both in the state and in the fruit of my state. What do I do to fix that? God's at the other end. He's at the burnt offering end, watching us from down there as we just came through the door with our sin and trespass offering going, Okay, you know, maybe call me when you get to where I'm at because it's a long way. We tend to minimize or marginalize how people come to the faith and the intensity. Sorry to say this, so I'm probably going to piss some people off, but you know what? I, I think I'm just going to start telling people I feel like I'm 90 so I can get away with it, all right? I identify as a 90-year-old, okay? <laughs> so I can be angry and mean and say whatever I want. But here's the thing because I've been having this conversation with a lot of people of late. You know, what you're looking at going on out there in the world, that is a direct byproduct of the church, I've said this many times, becoming impotent. And because I said to you last week about how the church likes to go and get people out of Egypt's bondage, but they don't want to spend any time camped, learning, teaching people God's ways. That's, that, that takes effort. That would be, that'd be difficult. We just want to keep people in a state of feeling good. You know, keep, keep the good feelings going, but never settle down to roll up the sleeves and say, now let's learn. Because this is what we're doing, is we're spending time learning about the things that God thought were vitally important for the children of Israel to make it with him, not make it out in the world, to make it with him. That's the missing component of the church. The church is so impotent now that you've got churches catering. Now, next chapter, let's stay back on track here. So my point is, when you look at a lot of these, you're going to be seeing, even here it says here, the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of it, the beaten corn, the oil made by fire. So we can clearly see that in this offering, there is a portion that is brought that is offered up to God. There is another portion that is consumed by the priests. There, in fact, 
are, if I'm not mistaken, there are rules on the offerer also partaking of this offering. So it would be first and foremost offered to God, the priest partakes, and I think there is a provision for the offerer as well. You're going to read several times over the reference to fine flour, fine. And each time you read that, I want you to think, okay, bad question probably for some people who have never done anything in a kitchen before, but if you have, have you ever sifted flour, <laughs> it's like, are there any, are there any coon hunters here today? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a few people lifted their hand like this. Okay, so if you've ever sifted flour, you know that the flour can be clumpy and, and uneven. So the whole concept of fine flour is to say that there was no unevenness in it. And again, where these are picturing types of Christ, here we have Christ as, think of it this way, flour is whatever it once was, beaten, bruised and beaten down. So in that respect, the fine flower represents a type of Christ. If you keep looking at all of these, you'll keep seeing the fine portion, no unevenness, no wavering. There is no changing in him. He is constant. All of the, the ingredients, actually, the details of the ingredients, they all have meaning. That's what's so amazing about everything that's in this book. All right. Equally, you're going to read in this offering the accompaniment of, already covered the salt portion, but salt and oil. And the scripture says over and over again, he shall pour oil upon it. A necessary ingredient in this offering, without the oil, the offering was incomplete. So it's an integral part of it. And again, I can't say this enough. You would not be able, if you're going to interpret this offering, the meal offering, through the eyes of the New Testament, you wouldn't even be able to bring this offering unless the Holy Spirit was operating to guide you to do it. Why? Because bread is the staff of life. Why would you part with something that you, too, would need to survive? In other words, the self out in the world before it's found by God takes care of self, and the self is deified. The self is the most important. So giving up this portion of bread, if you will, to offer it to God says probably you might care a little bit more about God than you do yourself. There's all of these, again, New Testament appropriations that you can glean out of this. No accident, by the way, that several times over we're reading about the depictions of Christ in the New Testament, how it says, for example, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. We've got other descriptions, for example, where it says in Luke's Gospel how after being tempted he returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, healing the sick, feeding the hungry. And then if you remember in the chapter, uh, fourth chapter of Luke, which is Jesus reading out of the 61st chapter of Isaiah, when he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. And there's those key words, anointed. I want you to think that what does that mean? We tend to kind of caricature, but again, God's Spirit being poured out to task, in this case, obviously, the Son of God. So don't look at the oil in this offering and simply look at it as a food ingredient. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So we've got the partakers, Aaron and his sons. They represent, we'll call it the man and the offerer, the individual, man's responsibility. And the offering, of course, is summed up as a sweet savor. In this offering, the offerer has nothing to do. He's just presenting, bringing, and the priests are going to do the rest, unlike some of these where they must come and they must lay the hand, for example, on the, on the animal to transfer, we'll call it vicariously. Uh, this is not that. So, all right, I've mentioned the baking types. Then I want to point out there are some contrasts I'd like to show you because the meal offering sometimes will be present and offered with a burnt offering and accompanying a first fruit offering. Why is that important? Because they're not standalone. A lot of times we read this, these five offerings are not standalone offerings. They are 
sometimes combined with one another for specific purposes. And you've got to read that clearly to see it. So let me turn to, this would be the sixth chapter of Leviticus, verse 14, the sixth chapter. This is the law of the meat offering, which should be meal offering. It's the same word. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar. And he shall take of his handful of the flour of the meal offering and of the oil thereof and all the frankincense which is upon the meal offering and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor, even the memorial of it unto the Lord. And the remainder thereof, so you can see not all is consumed, the remainder of it shall Aaron and his sons eat. With unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation they shall eat it. Don't you think that's odd that God even goes down <laughs> to the minuteness of saying where they should eat it? And again, I digress to say why. You know, eating... I'm going to just say something, it's not meant to be blasphemous, but food of the gods, God. You know, imagine if you had that bread in your hand, maybe you went outside into the camp. Wouldn't be totally off kelter to see the priest walking around with some, you know, whatever type of cake this is, and probably had a good smell to it, and all the people in the camp going, you know, I can follow the smell, that smells so good. Or maybe it would have been done like, look at me. I have, this is food that was offered to God, and I'm also getting to eat it. So you eat it in the holy place. Things that belong to God shouldn't be paraded around like there's something else. I like that God even spells it out there. It shall not be bacon with leaven, so no leaven involved. I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, as is the sin offering and as the trespass offering. All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Every one that toucheth them shall be holy. Then the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed, a tenth part of Ephaph, and it goes down, and so on. So we've kind of departed out of that instructions for the average person. Here's instructions for the priest and his sons. So why is this important? Because you can see repeatedly it's called a sweet savor, memorial. Not all of it is offered, so a portion of it is offered to God, a portion of it is going to Aaron and his sons. And then if you turn, take a look at this. In Leviticus 23, which enumerates the holidays or the festivals or feast times. In Leviticus 23, the Passover is listed first. Then you've got the wave sheaf of the first fruits on the day after the Sabbath, 50 days after the oblation of the first fruits on the day of Pentecost. The sheaf of first fruits on the day after the Sabbath might be burned to the Lord as a sweet savor, but the oblation of the first fruits at Pentecost might not be burnt on the altar. The reason is this the sheaf of first fruits was unleavened. So while the oblation of the first fruits at Pentecost was mingled with leaven. If you read this, okay, we've got Passover, starts with Passover in verse 5, 14th day of the first month, at even is the Lord's Passover, the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread. Unto the Lord, seven days he must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days, and the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. The Lord spake unto Moses, speak unto the children of Israel, and begins to tell him, There ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf, a he lamb without blemish of the first year for burnt offering. So here, we're now seeing them put together. So you've got a burnt offering being offered in verse 12. In verse 13, 
The meal offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, a fourth part of a hen. So it's kind of interesting. If you put all this together, you can see that there would be processes and set times where the burnt offering would be offered in conjunction with the meal offering. And if you read through all of these, you can kind of put together reasonable logic of why God would give these instructions this way. He goes on to say, shall eat neither bread nor parched corn, no green ears, until the selfsame day ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. The amount of detail just given in this. If we were dealing with, and a lot of people like to use this, you know, it's a good story. The book, had, the, This book has a lot of good stories in it. Friends, got to tell you something. When there's this much detail about how to proceed, this is more like a manual, not a tale or a good little story. This is like an operational manual on how to operate with God in the dispensation of the law. But the wonderful part about studying this is we see clearly throughout God is talking to us in the same application about Christ. In fact, something remarkable as I was preparing for this message and I was thinking, yes, Christ is the bread of life and all the names that we have for Christ, but it, there was something that clicked in my brain. You could hear something or read something a thousand times and thousand and one is where the lights go on. You go, wow. You remember where it said, it says how Christ did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then you start reading all of this from the tabernacle to the offerings. And you can see here is the shadow and type filling in the blanks, if you will, of what the fulfillment will look like when he comes in the flesh. No longer the offerings, again, he was our burnt offering, absolutely, voluntarily and by himself, a life offered up. Does he become the meal offering for us? Yes, the fruits of that life offered up as well. In the peace offering, as I said, if we have time, and I might just kind of introduce them in the peace offering, we've got more of the concept of communion and fellowship. And obviously, you can't get to communion and fellowship, brotherly love, or a life offered up to God if your starting point isn't understanding that you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner, and that we have committed trespasses because... That's the important part, is coming to that understanding begins how we can approach God properly and not in a cavalier way or without understanding. God put all this out as if to say, I'm giving you as many breadcrumbs as I can, no pun intended, but the people didn't want to follow them, right? Now we're looking at this, and I keep saying bird's eye view because in a bird's eye view, the offerings show the way of approach. The offerings depict and show every functioning capacity of the life and work of Christ or our life in Christ or if you want to call it the things that God looks on as important. And all of that is within these five offerings. So don't get hung up on any one particular thing. All right. If you remember, I said Christ is in all of this seen as a man standing as man and God, but standing in for mankind as the priest, our high priest, servant of God, carrying out the prescriptions of God. But the peace offering, which is in the next chapter over, through third chapter of Leviticus, shows all parts of this kind of interesting. Let me read a little bit about the peace offering. If his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, and that peace offering, by the, by the way, shalem, from shalom, from salem, peace. If he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. So this one, different from the burnt offering, which had to be a male without blemish, different from the meal offering, which was no meat at all, here can be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. He shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering 
and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. He shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord, that the fat that covereth the inward parts and all the fat that is upon the inwards, the two kidneys, the fat that's on them, which is by the flanks, the call above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar, upon the burnt sacrifice, which is the wood, upon the wood that is the, the fire, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. So you can see, again, here, this offering is not concerned with bring a male, so this offering is not the same in terms of the value as the burnt offering, which if we were going to identify the burnt offering does have an immediate and conclusive attachment to Christ here, male or female. So that's, you're, you're separating that out repeatedly by repeating this, male or female tells you this is an offering in a different class category. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round upon the altar. One more time, and if he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof and the rump, he shall take off hard by the backbone the fat that covereth the inward parts, the fat that is upon the innards, the two kidneys, the fat that's upon them, which is by the flanks, the call above the liver, the kidneys, he shall take it away and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat. So now we've gone down from herd, flock, goat, and the how-tos around it. So I don't need to keep reading. I want to go to the last two verses. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. So don't you think that's interesting? All the fat belongs to the Lord. So you can definitely see, again, we've looked at the burnt offering, the meal, and the peace, and you can see where there are clear and distinct differences. Now again, these three offerings what they share in common, you've got offering made by fire. What they share in co common is none of these are attached to sin or trust. I'm reiterating this because there's so much confusion. When I read, I go through a lot of material and I can see how confused people are over these offerings and why it matters, it matters. Okay, so we know that in the seventh chapter, I believe, of, yes, in the seventh chapter, you've got more instructions for the peace offering. See, that's another thing. A lot of people like to read the Bible straight through. Nothing wrong with that. But here, I'm going to make a perfect case in point about something I was making about choose the right Bible for you. Because people who are reading too advanced of a Bible for their reading level will try to read through a book in order as the order appears chapter and verse. And while there's nothing wrong with reading through the book like that, I just showed you clearly that you could read the book in a better order if you were trying to read about the peace offering, for example, you'd be in the third chapter and the seventh chapter, and there are a few verses in other chapters and some other books to read. So that wisdom that says, oh, I'm, I'm reading through this book, that's okay, but if you have a right reading level, you're going to, it'll immediately be clear to you, hey, why are we reading the peace offering in? Because it's going to elaborate and give more detail that the previous information did not contain. So that's just kind of an idea of why. But peace offering, 7 and verse 11, and this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. This is a key one, as it's now giving you, we'll call it color, to the offering. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. 
Thanksgiving, think more about a pr more along the lines of praise than thanks, but uh, that's the instructions. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. And if he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for a heave offering unto the Lord, it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offering. So we go back to the priest portion of doing his responsibility. And if the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered, he shall not leave any until the morning. So here we have a restriction. Offering it must be consumed that day. A little bit, think of it like God gave orders about the manna, how much manna you can gather, why you needed to eat it, and you couldn't go back and do seconds except for the day that God prescribed here. He says, must be consumed the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow, so here's the distinction. It's either thanksgiving slash praise, or it's a vow, or a voluntary offering. It shall be eaten the same day that he offered his sacrifice. On the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And I think that's equally interesting. Again, there's always these neatly embedded third day references here. That's kind of interesting. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed unto him that offer it. It shall be an abomination. So two days earlier, good thing. Two days late, bad thing. With God, it matters, okay? And the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. And the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten, shall be burned with fire. As for the flesh... All that be clean shall eat thereof, and the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. So here is the first time in the peace offering that we have mention of something where essentially if the person is labeled unclean. So again, to be able to distinguish between all of these different offerings and ingraining their differences, it'll become clear to you when you see the differences. So you go and you recap the burnt offering, a life fully offered up, the bulk of it offered up, completely ascending to God, consumed to God, a male, voluntary, clean. That's that offering washed with water in the inward parts. The meal offering. Go through that, what we just recapped. Here we've got the peace offering. And the peace offering, if the meal offering, there were no animals offered here. Animals are offered, but it's male or female. That's fine. But then if your peace offering is an offering that's either a thanksgiving, a praise, or a vow, that changes the dimension of the offering and how it needs to be offered and how it may be consumed. Now you might say, well, is there a reason? What does this Represent And once more, I'm going to tell you, this offering will be tied into fellowship and communion, the right relationship, if you want, kind of combining a little bit of the attitudes of the burnt and the meal within the peace, but for a purpose, which I'm not going to get into right now. I'll take this up because we've got a lot more of this. The laws of the offerings are very, there's a lot of material. And I don't want to race through them too fastly. But the point that I do want to point out that I think is probably the most important. God says, I want you to do all this. And depending on the person's circumstance, we, don't, we tend to think, okay, they had an offering that was a continual offering that was being offered night and day. Sorry, yes, morning and evening in the burnt offering. Then you've got the meal offering, which had its own occasions to offer, and then the, those two might be offered in conjunction, as I read to you earlier, a burnt and a meal offering together. Now, you might have an offering of a peace offering that technically could not be, you probably would not find your peace offering offered with a burnt offering, although it could happen, but all of these different combinations, but what you're not going to see, God kind of gets through, these are relational to him, 
And the last two, the sin and trespass, have they are relational to him too, but they're more about the reconciliation that needs to happen between the believer vicariously transferred on to the animal by the shed blood, by the hands of the priest, that then makes the person acceptable in God's eyes. So knowing the differences and the specifics in each category. When I say category, it's kind of interesting because the categories, for example, for each one of these, each offering, except for sin and trespass, it has its own class of categories, but the burnt offering, the meal, and the peace all have built in within them for the rich, the not so rich, and the poor. And the instructions are, if you were a dummy, you could do this. Okay, that's why there's all these details, because it was given that people, we know there's a long history of people doing what's right in their own eyes, worshiping how they want, doing what they want. So God says, I'm going to spell it all out for you so that you don't have to do any thinking. You just show up with your offering. You offer your offering the way I've prescribed it. You follow the order. That's how you're going to relate to me. Now, I'm glad that we don't live in that dispensation anymore, that we get to relate to God through our faith in Christ, knowing about Christ. But it's important because the details, as I said, of each and every one of these give you insight not only into the mind of God and how think of we read and we try to process the information and take it in, but think of the, the original speaker giving the instructions. And that I don't think we do often enough. We're not God, but I want you to think of if we were at God's side and God's giving out these instructions, there's a reason why he specifically says, take the meal for the burnt offering or for the meal offering, it's just going to be a fine flower, or for the peace offering, it's a male or a female, and these are the conditions in which you offer, and again, in the sin and the trespass. Why? Because these people had not yet learned. They had seen all of the miraculous happenings in Egypt, but they had not yet learned, and I personally don't think they ever really came to learn God's ways and what mattered to God. And this is why, I will repeat it again, the church has fallen flat in its responsibility. You know, if the church just thinks, let's go get people, let's go save people out of the world, Egypt's bondage. But there's never any of this instruction, which, yes, I'm going to be the first person to tell you, you know, you're not going to leave here going, woohoo, cakes of flour burnt on the oil. Not, I don't know anybody who's going to get, except if you're hungry right now, you're going, damn, that sounds good. <laughs> cakes, a little oil, salt, right? But it's not going to be exciting. But on an educational level, coming to know about God, it adds a dimension of something that I'm sorry, no amount of hallelujahs, amens, all of the, we'll call them the 7-Eleven platitude words that people tend to toss around. It's not going to do anything for you, but you, you're really getting to see what I'd call the underneath it all of what God says, this is what's important to me. Let me jump back for a minute for one thing. If you start looking at the underneath it all. The underneath it all, God said, build me a place that I will come live so I can commune with you. God knew man's too, when I say man, humankind, we're too smug. We're too full of ourselves to recognize how destitute our condition is. So God says, I want to live amongst you and I want to relate to you. But before that can even happen, because obviously some of you are just so hard-headed or stiff-necked or you think you know better, I'm going to put all this out in great detail, and you're going to know exactly, so there'll be, there'll be no guessing of what I'm expecting of you. And I want you to think about this, because you could say that the need to study this is to see that God went to all this work and all this labor to make this understandable for the hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds, thousands upon thousands within the children of Israel. And yet, where are we now? And none of these things are practiced anymore. None of these offerings can be made. Somebody brought up a point from something I said probably two weeks ago. Yes, in the future time when Christ returns, the book of Zechariah says that God's going to force those people, in general, all will have to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. 
be careful that you don't succumb to reading that and thinking it's possible that God will enforce people living in temporary structures, yes. It's possible that God will enforce them bringing the offerings of the Feast of the Tabernacles, yes. But the most important portion of the Feast of Tabernacles is who tabernacled among us will be coming back. That's the most important thing about the Feast of Tabernacles. That will be a shadow or a type that then comes standing in real life, personified itself, Christ, as the Feast of Tabernacles, tabernacling once more amongst us. So I think people can get hung up on the concepts of offerings and not recognize that within them there are laws of interpretation twice, three times, sometimes four times over that will take us into different areas. But the most important one is God is saying, you want to know about me? You, you really want to know about me? Start listening. They didn't have a book like we do, but start listening to the instructions because the instructions reveal something about God that I think most people who just want to skip this book because it's boring don't care to know. With God, the details mattered back then, and guess what? They still matter today. He's not asking you to go out and sacrifice an animal. He sent his only begotten son, so there are no more sacrifices of that nature. But to not take it so glib and so cheaply or so cavalierly, well, it's, it's just, you know, you begin to read the instructions and you realize there's a lot of depth here, which is God was trying to tell the people this is more than just a robotic activity of bringing an animal to be killed because God is not some sadistic weirdo sitting on his throne saying, I just like to see blood. There were principles being taught, ways of approach, God's method with man, which is something we wrestle with all the day long. But these instructions not only show the work of Christ, explain to us our salvation, but they show us the mind of God. That God says, don't think that you're showing up, colloquial concept here, you're showing up deserves you getting a trophy just because you showed up. God says, I expect a little more. Now, in this day and age, we're not having to go through all these exercises. God says, in this day and age, God's looking for trust. God's looking for us to be faithers, trusting in his word. That's a small requirement, if you will, in comparison to everything that's divulged here. But don't discount this because you think, well, I only live in the age of faith and trust, and that's all that matters, because in this Old Testament, you're going to find the details about something that mattered to God, that he cared enough to repeat it over and over and over again. What are all these things, these five things, burnt offering, meal, peace, sin, and trust, they all have something in common. They're all called offerings. I love the fact that the modern church, especially those people who, and I get, trust me, I get mail and lectures from these very same people. It's all about the law. You're right, God had to give the law because people couldn't govern themselves. Now, we're no longer living in the disp dispensation of the law, but what's important to understand is in the law, you really get to see why God had to go to all this great detail. And what was God teaching the people? Well, outside of the meal offering, outside of it, there was never a time when there was not something offered in the place of. Never. From Go right back to the garden where God slayed an animal so that he could clothe Adam and Eve when they knew they were naked. There was never a time when God said, you can just show up, and guess what? So glad you did. Here, here's the reward for just showing up. That's not God's way. That's what the world has done. That's what the world has spoiled, especially this last generation here with you get a trophy for showing up. God says, I'm interested in knowing if you even care about what matters to me. So I'm going to write it down in a book. I'm going to make it really complex and very verbose. And if you really care about me, you're going to learn this thing not memorize it like some ro robot, but you're going to learn about this because in here you'll find about all of my concerns for the creation I made. You'll find out why I wanted you to go through these exercises because you couldn't do it on your own. You couldn't figure it out. on Left on your own, 
the best you could do was a golden calf. Left on your own, the best you could do was obey the serpent in the garden. Left on your own is all you could do. Now I'm here and I'm going to live among you, but you're going to do it my way. You know, God's not imposing his law upon us, but he's still saying you're going to do it my way. And that way in, in our day and age is walking with Christ, knowing the word, learning his word, and caring enough to know what's in this book, not just showing up to church and somebody stands at the pulpit and says, this is my Bible, and I know it's my Bible, and whatever else they say, and then they put the Bible down, and they go on to talk about other things. And you know who I just talked about? I don't need to say names. Now, just try this on for size. Imagine that same, this is my Bible, and blah, 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 that actually said, now open up your Bible, and let's read, and let's figure out what this means for the multitude of people that sit and listen and think that they have been churched on Sunday or whatever day they're attending church, when I'm sorry, all you've had is you've had your mind numbed over with platitudes of stupidity. Now, you may have sat here while I was talking and be, been a little bit glazed over because it is, I said to you, it is a little dry. But you're leaving here with some substance, and the substance is that out of God's word, if you care enough, It'll mean something to go back and read it, but reading it with New Testament eyes and reading it with the understanding that these five offerings spell out the way of salvation. If you're interested in what all that means really unfolded properly, be here next week. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.